I love the story of Jesus' first miracle, the wedding at Cana and turning water into wine. I love that it is so not ethereal. It's so down to earth. Now, it doesn't make sense to people like the practical steward, why waste the very best wine on folks who were already schnockered and wouldn't know the difference? What is the utilitarian justification for this excess? And why is Jesus bothering about the wedding of some nobodies in a backwater town? Martin L. Smith, who is an Episcopal priest who was writing last month in Sojourner's magazine, says, imagery of excess of divine surplus and overflow is essential for the proclamation of God's reign. Christ comes not merely to address a lack in us or to meet our so-called needs. The good news is of a divine excess bound to surpass abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine." End quote. There is no scarcity when it comes to God's love. No stinginess in the abundance God pours out upon each of us. A rich, sweet, joyful overflow of goodness, of blessing, of delight. Now, I grew up worrying, and some of you may have too, about there never quite being enough. Not enough love, not enough attention, certainly not enough money to fill the emptiness I felt. It's only been in my Christian walk that I'm able to glimpse how different that is from God's idea of what we need and what God is ready to pour out for me and for each one of us. When we can receive that love, we learn that there's more room in our own hearts for more, not fewer, cherished friends. For so it is with God, who loves each of us so extravagantly, no holding back, no comparing us with the others who might be prettier or smarter or more spiritual, whatever that means. God delights in us and is longing for us to receive God's holy, abundant love. Are we able to see that, believe in that, open our eyes and hands to receive? There's a passage in C.S. Lewis's book, The Last Battle, where a bunch of wretched, contrary, grumpy, warring dwarves refuse to see a divine feast that is laid out before them in the next life. They think they're eating bits of straw and moldy vegetables instead of the rich wine and food that everybody else can see. Sometimes we too get lost in our own wounded outlook and we can't even recognize the joy that God freely offers us. There have been times in my own life, too, when I have pouted, crossed my arms, and refused to accept some gift, some goodness, some realization that I am deeply loved, some glimpse of how, as one of my priest friends proclaimed, God adores you. One of the joys deep joys of a walk with Jesus is that I get to relearn all that and remember it and take into myself the amazing truth that there is overflowing love even for me, even with all my imperfections, as there is for you, regardless of how unhappy or broken you feel. God 
does not need you to empty huge jars of a purification ritual on yourself before you can come to the feast. God tosses out all of our schemes to get good enough on our own. The Holy One pours forth the wine of Christ's own lifeblood, the overflowing lavishness of God's own self with us. Love rolls forth like waters, like justice. Along with God's love comes always true repentance for when we've been much less than loving. And then God pours forth redemption, transformation, just as the prophet Amos says, Amos, who's always thundering and railing against the selfish cruelty of people who've never learned to love or serve others. Amos cries, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Justice and righteousness roll forth because God's love is also justice, because God cherishes and upholds those whom the world sees as of little value. God's love seeks to wash away the injustice and cruelty that says, might makes right, or money makes right, or manipulation and domination make winners. Our selfishness and division ultimately will never stand against the mighty flood of God's love and justice. God loves us deeply, and that love is meant to strengthen and empower us for good. Tomorrow is the day we honor the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and his legacy. Over the years, it's become a familiar and perhaps comfortable holiday, but I'd like to remind us that the quotes and the videos and the bits of famous speeches we have heard again and again might have become a bit too familiar to us, so much so that we're in danger of forgetting the power of who that servant of God really was among us. Martin Luther King did say, I have a dream. But he didn't mean it in some dreamy way. His dream and the dreams of other oppressed people are the opposite of nostalgic fantasies. Let's not forget that many of us, even us right here, even those who consider ourselves progressives, weren't always comfortable with Dr. King when he was alive and challenging injustice that we had been sitting with or ignoring. When he called out the privileged, like us, and the powerful and popular leaders of his day to step up and make concrete changes in laws and practices. When he preached fiery sermons that were, as we sometimes still say, too political. Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail was written to fellow Christians and clergy who were urging him to compromise, to go along to get along, instead of speaking out as he did and leading protests and marches as he did. And there, in a wretched, dirty jail where he and others were unjustly imprisoned, he said uncomfortable things like, I should have realized that few members of a race that has oppressed another race can understand or appreciate the deep groans and passionate yearnings of those that have been oppressed. And still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. And he said, the question is not whether we will be extremist, but what kind of extremist will we be? Will we be extremists for hate? 
or will we be extremists for love? And this dedicated minister of God, who was faithful to God's love and justice to the very end of his life, also had the courage to tell the truth to the church he loved so well. He said, If the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authentic ring forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning. I know we don't want that. I invite you, my beloved friends, to sit here for a moment in silence, opening your hearts first to receive God's overflowing, unending, unconditional love for you. And then to ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and ears to the path of loving service, justice, and self-sacrifice that Jesus has set before us all. And may God bless us in that journey. Amen.